Hello everyone, this is Tom from Los Angeles. I hope everyone is doing well. I'm uh, going to talk about the fourth canto of the Divine Comedy today, um, following both the Pinsky translation and uh, Mark Musas for, for reference. Uh, the fourth canto is a little peculiar, um, especially in the sense that uh, it contains uh, so many um, names, specific uh, names, in fact uh, 48 of them among historic uh, people and uh, mythological characters. Uh, there are so many, it's almost uh, one uh, per, uh, for, only, for each third line or second line. And, uh, and so it risks to come across as a little bit uh, dull and boring, but uh, there is a lot um, of interest in it. It's the canto where Dante presents the famous Limbo. Uh, it's also the canto where um, Dante is uh, showing us uh, voluntarily and in part involuntarily. It's almost like Dante is doing um, a, a bookshelf tour type of tag. If he was a booktuber, canto 4 would be his uh, bookshelf tag type of bookshelf tour type of uh, video because um, he is really making a selection a list of uh, authors and books that uh, not only he loved but that in particular were present on uh, many of the bookshelves that he was using in his times in his studies in his research etc so uh, it's a very important historic document from that point of view. Dante is waking up for he, from his uh, almost collapse and fainting that had at the end of uh, the third canto. And he's uh, um, waking up uh, to in a, in a vast space, um, breaking the deep sleep that filled my head. A heavy clap of thunder startled me up as though by force. With rested eyes, I stood, peering to find where I was. He is uh, trying to discern in the darkness what type of place he is. And uh, uh, Vir Virgil is the first one to speak this time, as opposed to Dante asking the question. And uh, uh, he says, now we descend into the sightless zone. I will go ahead, Virgil. Um, I will go ahead. And you second. Um, and seeing his pallor, I answered, How can I venture here if even you, who have encouraged me, even time I falter, turn white with fear? Dante is seeing that Virgil is looking pale and, and almost fearful. So, how is that supposed to encourage me to proceed and follow you into this darkness? Uh, and Virgil explains, It is the pain. People here suffer that paints my face this color of pity, which you mistake for fear. Now on. I'm not afraid, Dante, Virgil says. It's not fear, it's actually pity. More than pity, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, his own um, compassion for the people who um, are condemned to live for eternity in limbo and for himself, because this is exactly where in uh, the afterlife Virgil is condemned to be forever and this is why he has a personal strong reaction to the place here we encountered no, la no laments that we could hear except for sighs that tremble the timeless air there are no cries or laments or uh, screams like in many other places of hell but really only sighs and uh, um, some type of melancholy in terms of uh, of mood the not agonies but sadness and uh, uh, Virgil again proactively asks uh, don't you ask what spirits are these in limbo um, the um, the explanation comes uh, voluntary and very quickly from Virgil he says before you go on I tell you they did not sin if they have merit it can suffice without baptism portal to the faith you maintain some live before the Christian faith so they did not worship God Right, and I am one of these. Through this, no other fault, we are lost, afflicted only this one way, that having no hope, we live in longing. 
we live in longing. So the damned souls in limbo are not condemned to a particular punishment and there isn't really a contrapasso type of punishment for them. They are simply, in a sense, condemned to be fully aware of the presence of, uh, of the divine presence, of the presence of God, and not being able to enjoy it, but uh, constantly desiring it, constantly having, um, as Pinsky translates it, a longing for God, while uh, Mark Musa uh, translates it more literally as a desire. The word that Dante uses is desire, a deep desire for God that can never be satisfied. This is um, the, in a certain sense, the damnation that they are suffering. Um, this is obviously a, a, a very um, a concept that was very in line with the medieval Christian uh, theology, but it's also um, even logically, even from a commonsensical point of view, a little bit, uh, uh, at least, slightly controversial, right? Um, Limbo is the place where everyone who is not being baptized and everyone who lived before Jesus Christ is condemned to. So they're including infants, including non-baptized um, babies and everybody who is, is born before that. So um, instinctively, if, you're, if you think about it, one of the first questions that come to your mind is um, how is this fair? How does this really uh, strike people of, uh, of fairness? They, they didn't know anything, they maybe did not commit any sin, and in fact they didn't, that's why they are in limbo, and therefore um, they should be just as the, the, um, deserving paradise as people who are in paradise. But only because they were um, on earth before the coming of Jesus Christ, they are in limbo. It's um, it's an interesting uh, question. I'm not going to uh, delve too deep into it, and it's much more complex, of course. But something that fascinates me is the fact that uh, uh, the first time that I reread the Divine Comedy, and I, I came to Canto 19 of Paradiso, and uh, realized that for the first time that Dante himself is asking himself this question. So. Only he waits until Canto 19th of Paradiso to actually tell us about it, but uh, he is uh, clearly um, a little bit puzzled by this uh, entire situation. In, uh, I'm going to just anticipate the fact that in uh, Canto 19th of Paradi Paradise, there is an incredibly cinematic and, and visually creative scene where the souls, I think it's the sixth, uh, circle of, of, of heaven, of paradise, um, those souls are uh, moving in the sky while flying and forming different letters to spell out words in Latin for Dante to understand what they're saying, which in itself is an incredibly fascinating vision. And after they have um, finished the last word that ends with M, they stay in an M formation for a while and then the M transforms itself into an eagle, the perfect shape of an eagle, and talks to Dante from the eagle's beak. Uh, while reading his thought and therefore speaking what Dante wants to ask, uh, this eagle tells uh, Dante uh, his own thoughts, which is how is that fair that uh, uh, not only people who live before Jesus Christ, but in, uh, in Canto 19th of Paradiso, he says uh, uh, people who live uh, across the Indo, uh, Hindu river, basically people that have not come in contact with Christianity either by time and history or by geography, by geographic reasons, uh, how is it fair that they don't come to join paradise, etc.? And uh, I would say we'll discuss the answer that he receives in, uh, when we read Paradise, but it's an extremely fascinating point, and I find it even more fascinating the fact that Dante himself uh, had this question inside himself and uh, expressed it in the Divine Comedy. He doesn't simply repeat 
and expresses um, Christian theology um, as it was, he personalizes it in a certain sense. Another way in which uh, Dante uh, personalizes and uh, puts his own personality into this canto is in asking another very interesting question to Virgil about limbo, and this is the question. In the th this is verse uh, 37. In the faith that conquers every error, did ever anyone go forth from here by his own good or perhaps another's to join the blessed after? In other words, he's asking Virgil, did anyone ever get out of this, of this limbo? And uh, he, Virgil, understood my covert meaning and said, it, it, he calls it covert meaning because he's actually saying to Virgil, uh, is, I'm talking also about yourself. Is it possible that you, Virgil, will one day be admitted into heaven or paradise? Did anyone ever um, get out of limbo? I was new to this condition. This is what Virgil says. I was new to this condition. I had just arrived in limbo when I beheld a mighty one who descended here. Um, we know that uh, Virgil died um, not many years before uh, Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. This is why he was just new to this limbo. He, just, he had just arrived and a few years after Jesus Christ resurrected and uh, um, arrived into, into hell. This is the um, tradition. Uh, resurrected, uh, resurrected Christ uh, descended into hell to, uh, as he says, arrayed with the crown of victory. And he recalled back from this place the shade of our first parent, which is um, Adam, and his son Abel, uh, obviously not Cain, and uh, other shades who dwelled in limbo, Noah and Moses, etc. Um, in other words, all the big protagonists of the Old Testament, the great people, at least, of the, of the Old Testament, Jesus uh, uh, took them and uh, brought them to, to paradise. And know this, no human soul was saved till this, these souls. Um, there was a wood of thronging spirits, not trees, but thronging spirits. This is how thick the presence of uh, souls around them is in this place. Nor did we make much distance from the place where I had slept, when I saw a fire that overcame a bleak hemisphere of darkness. In this darkness there is a, a hemisphere in fact, it's a hemisphere of light, we should say, and this is um, how Musa, Mark Musa, translates Dante in hemisphere of light. Pinsky says hemisphere of darkness, a fire that overcame a bleak hemisphere of darkness. Probably comes out more in a more straightforward way in the Musa translation. Well, before we stop to address them, I could see people there and sense they were honorable folk. This word honor and honorable in its uh, root uh, is repeated at least eight or nine times, I think eight times in, the, in this canto. It's all about honor um, because now he's going to start listing some of his, uh, um, his idols, literary and philosophical idols. How come uh, there is this distinction? How come there is this uh, fire? And uh, who are these people who command a place so separate? from the other ones? Why are they enjoying this privileged place with a little bit of light in this hemisphere of light? And Virgil says, uh, their honored names, which still resound in your life above, have earned them heaven's grace, advancing them here. Uh, these people under these great honors are uh, um, the great Omer, uh, Horus, Lucan and Ovid. Horus, Lucan and Ovid were this tri triad of uh, great poets uh, really uh, admired as the greatest almost during Dante's times. Uh, Homer was as well, in fact Homer was probably the greatest of the greatest in terms of uh, fame and reputation. However, there are some uh, interesting notes here to, to highlight because um, Dante uh, knew Homer, he knew about Homer but he couldn't understand ancient Greek and he couldn't read Greek. So, uh, plus, in his times there were no um, 
Latin translations of the Iliad and Odyssey. So he had to read only snippets of Homer from some other um, authors, like for example, Cicero, Seneca, and, uh, and so he knew about Homer's writings very much indirectly. Um, but obviously he knew about him, and that's why he puts him here in this uh, uh, congregation of the greatest poets. Together there, the splendid school of the Lord of Highest Song, who like an eagle soars high above the others. Uh, by this, uh, Dante means uh, the epic poetry. They are the greatest, not only poets, but um, among the epic uh, poets. And, uh, and this makes it uh, even uh, uh, funnier, in a sense, the fact that he himself puts himself in the group together with them. Because what he says is, uh, um, among themselves they turned and greeted me with cordial gestures, hello Dante, at which my master smiled, and far more honor that fair company than made me one among them. So as we traveled onward toward the light, I made a sixth amid such store of wisdom. I was the sixth one, uh, additional to these five great, uh, of the greatest of the greatest poets of, of, uh, of antiquity. This was uh, unheard of, of, of somebody just putting himself together with these people. And this is Dante's personality, um, you know, absence, complete absence of um, modesty. It's, uh, as we mentioned before, something very peculiar of, of Dante's writing. He had no shame in, in doing this. And we know that he was right, in fact, but uh, the fact that he uh, did it like that, it's, uh, it's funny in a way. And uh, speaking of matters, I will not give breath. Silence as fitting now as speech was there. He is uh, basically chatting with them, but uh, he finds it fair not to tell us what they were chatting about. There is a little bit of irony there probably as well. They walk together and they come to a castle. There is this uh, big field and a castle uh, circled by seven walls. The seven walls, uh, have been intended as allegory for, we're not really sure what, they could be trivium and quadrivium, the different uh, subjects of uh, uh, current education in, in uh, Dante's times, or maybe the seven liberal arts, it's not completely clear. Um, they were defended by uh, uh, a river, and passing this river there was this little bridge the bridge has been intended as uh, probably eloquence. It could be eloquence or it could be something else, but uh, um, many have read an allegory in the bridge as well. Walking forward together with uh, always this group of uh, great poets and together with Virgil, Dante sees uh, inside the castle, they come to a court that is in the center of the castle. And uh, again, let's remember that this is a very non hellish looking environment, the, probably the only one of the entire inferno. Yes, it's still dark, but uh, this castle has a little bit of a um, light over it. Uh, they have really increased the dignity, the human dignity, and uh, only for this reason, even if they are not allowed to go to heaven or paradise, uh, they have a special treatment, in, uh, in at least in, in Dante's vision. And uh, so it, they're walking into this court in the center of the castle, and inside the castle, Dante basically sees two groups of, of souls, two groups of people. The first group are the um, warriors and the people who are part of, uh, who were part of the big wars between um, Troy and uh, Trojans and Latins, all the Roman history as well, and uh, a little bit in an elevated, um, meadow or, or, or spot on the, in the garden, the philosophers and greatest intellectuals. In fact, uh, um, I raised my eyes a little and there was he, who is a knowledge master of those who know, sitting in a philosophic family. This is Aristoteles and uh, for Dante and for the people in, in his times, 
Aristoteles was not the greatest among the philosophers, but he really incarnated, he was philosophy. Because um, when Dante said philosophia or philosophy in general, he meant the system of uh, uh, the method and, and research system that was had been formulated by Aristoteles. Going back to the sources and what type of books Dante had at his disposal for his research, um, he didn't absolutely didn't have Aristoteles books to read. In fact, uh, he knew about Aristoteles from Saint Thomas Aquinas, and Saint Thomas Aquinas himself. Um, had known, had studied Aristoteles thanks to um, Albertus Magnus, his master, who had been studying uh, on uh, the texts of the great Avicenna and Averroes, I hope I'm pronouncing those right, the great uh, Muslim philosophers and thinkers and uh, who lived around the uh, 11th and 12th centuries. And uh, during the almost the peak of what is known as the Muslim golden era or the golden era of Islam, which is uh, uh, something that really fascinates me even if I don't know much about it and I would love to learn a bit more about that era. So I'm going to skip um, all this portion where Dante is listing names of people. I'm only highlighting three. I'm highlighting the fact that Dante mentions the Saladin of Arabia and he's mentioning uh, Avicenna and Averroes as well, uh, which is quite uh, important because they're all three of them are Muslims, and uh, uh, they're first of all the first Muslims that are mentioned in this uh, huge Christian poem or Christian epic. He didn't need to, but he did, uh, in part for you know as part of uh, Dante's cultural landscape. Uh, we are still inside. Um, the Muslim golden era and so the Divine Comedy itself um, it does have a lot of influence from uh, uh, Muslim thinkers and Muslim works. Avicenna and Averroes were really considered like great masters of thought and intellect. Uh, they were also, Avicenna and Averroes, they are the only modern philosophers that Dante mentions and puts here in this uh, uh, courtyard inside this castle. The fact that he also mentions the Saladin, who was the uh, first sultan of Egypt and Syria and who had uh, waged wars against Christians and uh, Templars and decapitated lots of Templars and uh, um, killed so many Christians. It, it says um, something about uh, Dante's overall uh, sense of universality and, uh, and reflects the type of cultural open-mindedness that was not only Dante's but uh, um, shared by many in, uh, in his times. This concludes uh, the fourth canto of the Divine Comedy. Thank you for watching. Um, I'm hoping to have sparked some ideas or stimulated some thoughts with, with my comments and uh, um, let's uh, continue the discussion. I look forward to the fifth canto next time. Thank you.